So I want to read this scripture to you, okay? I don't want you to get this into your spirit. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. I always had to stand to honor God's word, so let's do that right quick, okay? I know. Holy Ghost calisthenics, don't you love them? All right, up, down, up, down. Raise your hands. Good stuff, isn't it? This is what it says. Listen to this. For by that one offering, talking about the cross, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Can you get that? For by this one offering, God, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word again. Thank you for the presence of God that's in this room today. We thank you for your spirit that's here, alive, and well. And we just say, your kingdom come, your will be done right here like it is in heaven. Move Darren out of the way and do what only you can do. I need you, Jesus. I need you to speak this through me in a way that I can't speak it. I need you to deliver it to the hearts and the minds of people that need this today. That when we walk out of here, God, we're going to be completely changed and really free of some things today. I thank you for new open doors in our relationship with you because you are a good, good father to us. Thank you for all you're going to accomplish. We need you. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray it. And everybody says amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. Let me just read this verse again, then we're jumping right into it, okay? For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. My first point, the announcement I want to give to you this morning right off the bat is this. That if you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, if you have him in your life, the cross of Jesus Christ has made you perfect. Now, I get a lot, I get so many amens from there. But the reason why I don't get a lot of real big amens is because I know a lot of you might be thinking the same thing that I think sometimes. Oh, wait a minute, how in the world can you say that I'm perfect? Because my actions show that I am not perfect. Anybody with me there this morning? My words show that I'm not perfect. My thoughts, uh-oh, my thoughts are proof positive that I am not perfect. So how in the world can you say that I am perfect? Now, it's very important to understand something this morning about this verse. The first part of that verse is not talking about process. It's talking about position. As a matter of fact, process begins with position. How many of you dads out there... You've ever had a broken down car, or you had a broken down lawnmower, or you had a gadget you need to be fixed. What did you do first? You put it in a shop. You took it to a repairman. You took it to the garage. You put it in a position first so that it could be worked on and go through a process of being made right and being fixed, right? So process begins and starts with position. And you know, it doesn't matter how broken down that vehicle is or how messed up that lawnmower is. When a person takes it to a shop and they put it there and it's in position, it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks about it at that point. It doesn't matter if somebody else thinks it's a waste of time. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about it. It is in the position to go through a process. And all that really matters now is what the person working on it thinks. What the person working on it says about it and what they see in it. Because in the mind of the person that's doing the work, they know what they can do with it. So see, let me just say this right now right off the bat. This is not in my notes. You get this for free this morning. Stop letting your work be based upon what somebody else thinks about you and what somebody else has said about you. There's only one person that matters when it comes to what they say and what they see in you, and that is your Heavenly Father. That is Jesus. He's the only one that matters in what He says about you. And see, this is what happened the moment you trusted Jesus. God took you and placed you in Christ Jesus. That is your position. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says this. It is of God that I am in Christ Jesus. This is called justification. It means just as if I've never sinned. Let me show you an illustration I'm sure you've probably seen before. This is you. This is you and all of your 
thoughts of being unworthy. This is you thinking I'm not good enough. This is you and, and, and thinking, man, this is all my mess ups. But the minute you gave your life to Jesus, the, the day you really repented of all your sin, here's what happened. God took you, put you inside. This book represents Jesus. This Bible does. Put you inside Christ, and he shut the book, and there you are. So that means when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus, his righteousness, his goodness, and his perfection. That is your position. It is of God that you are in Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 says this. It says, here is the main point. It doesn't say secondary point or, uh, or uh, a byproduct or something. No, it says here is the main point. And if it's the main point, that means we've got to listen to it. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. So, first of all, notice what the main point is not. The main point is not your performance. The main point is not how good you did today. The main point is not all your good works. The main point is we have a high priest who's gone into the heavens. Now, indulge me here, humor me here, because I know you already know all about this, but let me take you back to the Old Testament and just remind you about how this happened back in the days when a high priest had to intercede for people. See, the Bible talks about how Jesus is our high priest. Romans says that he intercedes for us. So again, back in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, when Israel got all of their sins forgiven, here's what God did not do. He did not take six million people and judge them individually. Okay, you blew it, you blew it, you blew it, you messed up, you didn't measure up, you blew it, you didn't measure up, because guess what? Every one of us didn't measure up. All of us blew it, all of us messed up. But what God did do is he took six million people and he judged them collectively in one man. And that one man was the high priest. He had gone through a process, this man did, so that he was holy before God. And when God looked at the high priest, and if the high priest was holy, guess what that meant? That meant the people were holy. If the high priest was good, that meant the people were good. For those of you that raised your hand this morning and you are wondering how God thinks about you and how he really feels about you, because I believe that there's some people here today, you really believe that when God looks at you, he's constantly up there crossing his arms, just shaking his head at you with a frown on his face. I know that because that is a thing that I've battled in my head. If you're here and you're wondering, how does God really feel about me? What does he really think about me? Let me answer that question for you by asking you a question. Is Jesus perfect? Is Jesus holy? Is God satisfied with Jesus? Then guess what? That means God is satisfied with you because you are in Christ Jesus. That means if he's holy, that means you're holy. That means if he's good, that means you're good. That means if he's perfect, that means you're perfect. All that runs against the grain of our humanness, doesn't it? But it's not our perfection. It's his perfection, his holiness that's been applied to us and given to us as a gift. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 bears this out. It says, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, folks, righteousness isn't a reward for all the good works you did to have to earn it. Righteousness is a gift. We don't do a lot of good things so that we can get righteous. We do a lot of good things because we already have righteousness. I mean, again, think of it like this. Let me go back to the Old Testament one more time. We all know the Ten Commandments. They were placed inside of a big gold box called the, called the Ark of the Covenant. We know that. Now, we know that the Ten Commandments, that's the law. The law always speaks of punishment. It always speaks of judgment. Why? Because we always break it. Right? We're always breaking it. We're coming short of it. So, when God's holy gaze comes down to look at the law, it means he's got to execute punishment. Because he's a good God, he's a good judge, and a good judge does that. But thank God there was something placed on top of those Ten Commandments. It was a lid called the mercy seat. 
So when God's eyes gaze down toward the law, something is interceded, something is intercepted his gaze. He hits the mercy seat before it hits the law. So thank God, when God looks down, what does he see? He doesn't see judgment and punishment, no. His eyes fall on the mercy seat first. All God can see is not the law, but the law fulfilled. And guess what? Because Jesus is our mercy seat, because he's our propitiation, 1 John 2, 2, when God looks at us, he doesn't see law, he doesn't see judgment, he doesn't see punishment, he sees law, judgment, and punishment fulfilled because we are now in Christ Jesus. That's a good, good father, ladies and gentlemen. But Darren, what about my sin? What about my sin? Well, let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin for me so that I would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, some of you need to say this right now over yourself, especially if you raised your hand this morning. I want you to say out loud right now with me. Say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Say it again. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, the act of Jesus forgiving our sin was not a linear act. It was an eternal act. Now, what do you mean by that? Let me explain. Linear means having to be bound by time. All of us are linear people. We have a birth date and we have a day that we die. And we have a timeline. We live it day by day, month by month, year by year. In other words, we can't go backwards and forwards into time. All right, but we can't do that. We're trapped in a time bubble. We have to play it out. That's linear. Now, God is not linear. He created time, but he's not bound by time. God is eternal. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is the first and he is the last. One day is a thousand years to God and a thousand years is a day. So when God looks at a timeline, he doesn't see it like this, like we do. He sees the end from the beginning and he gets it all at once. That's amazing to me. That blows my mind. But if God didn't blow my mind, he wouldn't be God, would he? Amen? Amen. So here's the point. When Jesus paid the price for our sin, he did not pay them one at a time as we committed them. No. He took all sin for all humanity, for all time, forever, and he placed that price upon himself. I believe that when Jesus was on the cross, the position he was on, I believe that illustrates that. How? Think about it. With one arm, he's reached to the beginning of time. With the other arm, he reached to the end of time. And he took your timeline and mine, and he put it all up on himself, and he paid for every single sin. Thank God the cross has forever overpaid and dealt with and forgiven our sin. It really is finished. It is done for. That is why if you are in Christ Jesus, there really is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ, period. Not a hand, if, and, or but. It's period. And it doesn't just barely cover our sin. It overwhelmingly covers our sin and the thing that you're still feeling condemned about that happened years ago. A lot of you might not know this about me, but I'm going to make a confession this morning. <laughs> I might not get to come back after I say this. I am a classified nerd, okay? And what that, what that means is, all right, here we go. It means I like Star Wars, and I like Star Trek, and I like science fiction, and I like the Marvel movies. Okay, I, I know, I know, it's okay. All right, I'm still saved, all right? Anybody seen a Marvel movie in here? Anybody? Okay, thank God. I'm all right then. Maybe I'll get to come back, okay? All right, let me just do, use this as an illustration. You remember the Avengers? The movie The Avengers, the first one. The bad guy was Loki, okay? Loki was on a mission to, you know, destroy New York City and all of mankind and, you know, the whole hoopla that always happens with bad guys. So he's trying to do this. Well, anyway, there's a point in that movie where they trap Loki in this prison, and you remember Nick Fury, he's the leader of the Avengers. He's trying to find out Loki's motivation. And so he goes up to Loki and he says, he says, man, he says, we have no quarrel with you. 
And you remember Loki's response if you watched the movie and Loki looked at him and he kind of grinned and he said, an ant has no quarrel with a boot. You get that? It means there is, there is no argument here. An ant has no quarrel with a boot. I, I don't care if you're a, a red ant or, or, a, or a, a fire ant or if you're a giant ant or a black ant. It doesn't really matter. An ant has no quarrel with a boot. You, you don't get to say so. The, the, the comparison is so big. It's so much greater. It's beyond our uh, comprehension to compare the two. If I could take that line out of that movie and if I can redeem it for the gospel for just one second. I mean, you know, that'll, that'll be all right, okay? If I can redeem it for just one second. Let me say it like this. Your sin has no quarrel with the cross of Jesus Christ. Before sin can even make an argument, it slams out lust and anger and jealousy and murder and homosexuality, anarchy, adultery. His grace is greater than all our sin. But it's not freedom to sin, it's freedom from sin. See, this is where I've got to interject and just make sure that we don't misuse or misunderstand the grace of God. Freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. You see, sin always has consequences, and it should. But there are two types of consequences when it comes to sin. There is what I call a linear consequence, and there's an eternal consequence. Let me explain. If I drive home today and I drive home and decide I want to go 95 miles an hour in a 65 mile per hour speed zone, I can do that. I'm probably going to get picked up. And I'll get a ticket. Now, will God forgive me? Absolutely. But I'm still going to have to pay that fine. If I rob a convenience store, well, God forgive me if I'm really repentant of that. Absolutely, just as if it never happened. But I'm still going to go to jail. If I murder somebody, or I commit a heinous crime against somebody, or if I do something unthinkable, if I'm really repentant, will God forgive me? Absolutely. Just as if I've never sinned. But I still might get the death penalty. I still might be in jail for the rest of my life. Listen, I've recently seen pictures of, of, of people that are in prison. There's revival happening in these prisons. I've seen that. I've seen, I mean, just, just inmates by the hundreds. Just they're, all their hands are up. They're on their faces. They're crying out to God. They're laying on the floor. Revival is genuinely happening in the prisons across America. Has God forgiven them of, of, of lust or, or given them for, have they forgiven them for murder and, and robbery and, and for child sex abuse? Have they forgiven us? God forgiven all these things? If they really repented, absolutely. But they're not opening the doors to let them out. So see, there is a linear consequence and there's an eternal consequence. Thank God the eternal consequence has been forever paid. And if you're sitting here today and you're wrestling with a linear consequence, God wants you to know He still loves you. He still sees you as holy and perfect. And He will walk you through that today. But God wants you to understand today. That's the reason He hates sin. Because it mars up our life so much. And He wants you to be free from that. Thank God His grace is greater than all our sin. From all our sin. But tell what about the actions that I wrestle with? See, this is where the second part of Hebrews 10, 14 comes in. By this one offering, he has forever made perfect position. Those who are being made holy. That's the process. See, 1 Corinthians 3, 18 promises us the Spirit of God makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Now listen, obviously, let's just be honest. Some things happen for some people instantly when they get saved. I've seen some people delivered instantly from drug addiction. Instantly from alcohol addiction. But they might have a temper that still needs to be worked on. I've, I've seen other people being instantly delivered from a bad temper, but they're still wrestling with fear. Some people are instantly delivered from fear, but they're still working on forgiving somebody for something they did in their past. What's my point? The point is, is all of us in this room have something in our lives that requires process. So, Darren, what's the process? 
It kind of goes like this. It's like a, a lyric that a, a, an artist, a Christian artist named David Barone, he sang one time. He said, Lord, you took me out of Egypt. Now take Egypt out of me. In the same way, God has put us in Christ Jesus, but now we've got to get Christ Jesus in us. Well, how do we do that? What's the process? It's very simple. Just say this. Just get it in you. Say it with me. Say it with me. Just get it in you. All right, explain that to me. The best way I can do that is to go back, oh, 25, 26, 27, 28 years. I'm old. Uh, back in the early, mid-90s, my body started going whacked, crazy. Uh, I started getting cramps in all of my muscles. Everything that I did would cause them to burn. Uh, any motor skill, like playing the piano, was very painful. And my arms would just get so like they're on fire. I couldn't hardly move. Brushing my hair back when I had it, amen, that was painful. Brushing my teeth was painful. Walking was painful. Uh, I, I wear a size 36 waist now. I ballooned out to a size 42. I was losing my voice. I was turning yellow. I just felt like I was dying. And, and so I didn't know what was going on. Long story short, I went to the, the, the guy that was my family doctor for years before I retired. He drew blood, some blood, uh, some blood and did some blood tests. And he came back and he said, hey, he said, we found out what's going on with you. He said, I want you to come in. And he said, your thyroid level is off the charts. He said, you basically don't have one anymore. <laughs> he said, a normal level on a thyroid reading from a blood test is around a three or a four. He said, yours is above 200. And you're in a stage right now called myxedema, which means the next stage for you is you go into a coma and you die. So I'm grateful that they found it. So I said, okay, what's, what's the big fix for this? You know, I'm thinking what they're going to have to do, split me open, do some kind of surgery. He said, no. He said, you're going to have to take these thyroid hormone pills every day. And we're going to put you on this level for seven weeks. And when you get done with that, come back in. We're going to check you out, and we're going to go from there. I said, okay. So I went home, looked in the mirror. I mean, my face was... It was like somebody had beaten me up and my eyes were all swollen shut. I mean, I, I didn't look like myself. And so I remember looking in that mirror, hating what I saw. I look bad, I feel bad, I sound bad. I take that pill, that's my answer. I go to sleep that night, I wake up the next morning. I still look the same, feel the same. And I think to myself, this doesn't work about this medicine and I threw it in the garbage. No, I didn't do that. No, I didn't do that because I understand there's a process here. And the process is, I just got to keep getting this in me. But see, so many people do that with their relationship with Jesus. God, I gave you my life. I, I, mean, I went down to that altar. I wept and I prayed and I sought you. But I went to work the next morning. Something made me mad. And I spewed out these cuss words. You see, it just doesn't work. Condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. They just give up. No, no, no. There's a process here. See, don't you think the fact that you felt bad about cursing, don't you think that's a good sign? Used to, you used to say them and it didn't even matter. But now when you say them, they don't taste good in your mouth. You know why? Because God is working a process in you. If anything, congratulations to you. God is saying, you see there? I'm doing something in you. Those words wouldn't taste good in my mouth either. That means I am making you more like me. Just keep getting me in you. Just keep getting me in you. Until you get to the point where you don't even think about it anymore. God, I struggled. I prayed. I wept my eyes out. And then I found myself the next week right back on that computer at 2 a.m. in the morning watching porn again. See, I just can't stand myself. And they give up and quit. God says, congratulations, there was a day when you looked at that stuff and it didn't even bother you. Now you wince at it. Now you can't stand it. That means you're being made more into my image. Just keep coming to me. Just keep getting me in you. Just keep getting me in you. Because what happened is the same thing with what happened in my body. I took that pill. I took it for days. No change. But there came a point when I finally went, wow, I'm not feeling as sore as I used to be. Just keep getting it in you. Man, I came to a day when my pants started to get loose. My waist is going down. Just keep getting it in you. My voice 
started coming back. Just keep getting it in you. Things begin to line back up until finally my doctor said, we got you where we want you. Now the key is just keep getting it in you. Ladies and gentlemen, the key is just keep getting Jesus in you. He's not our pill, but he is our cure. Just keep worshiping. Just keep praying. Just keep getting the word in you. Just keep believing. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how bad I messed up today. I am in Christ Jesus. And I trust your supernatural work inside of me. He's creating you to be more like Jesus. And when you've got that kind of heart, he looks at you and he says, you're good enough. Because you're in Christ Jesus. You're in Christ Jesus. See, he's forming himself in you. Doesn't matter how broken you are. Your position is righteous. And you're being made beautiful in holiness. So I want to throw a word at you this morning. It's a word, maybe you've heard it before. It's a word called kensokori. Now, what is that? Let me tell you. Kensokori is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery. And here's how it happens. It takes the areas of breakage and it, it mends the areas of breakage with lacquer that's been dusted or mixed with powdered gold, silver, or platinum. Now, I tried to get a picture up here this morning, but it, 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 it didn't, didn't work out. So what I want to do, I want to try to get you to see this. This is a picture of Ken Sikori. I don't know if you can see it well or not. It's a pot. You see all those gold lines in it? That's where it was broken. Okay? Here? See where those gold lines are? That's where the pottery was broken. It used to be shattered. It used to be laying on the ground. But now there's this beautiful piece of art with all that wonderful gold all running through it. That's Ken Sikori. See, the thing I love about Ken Sikori is that, again, used to be in pieces on the ground. It was worthless. It wasn't good for anything. It's broken. It's not valuable anymore. And see, the enemy wants to make some of you think that this morning, especially those of you that raised your hands. He wants to tell you that, oh, because you've been broken, you're not valuable. God can't use you. you got to live in shame. You're an unworthy vessel. But I love Kinsu Corey because it repairs the vessel with the understanding that the piece is now more valuable for having been broken. It's more beautiful for having been broken. It's of greater use now because it's been broken. It doesn't treat the breakage as something to hide. It just treats it as part of its history. See, it was just an earthen vessel before. But now it's a vessel that's got a treasure on the inside of it. And that treasure is now what holds it together and makes it beautiful. Listen, this is who you are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you might be a broken earthen vessel, but you've got a treasure on the inside of you. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The silver, the gold, the platinum is Christ in you. And he is the one that holds you together and makes you beautiful and makes you worthy and makes you useful. Somebody is being reminded today, you don't have to live in shame to your past anymore. You just got to treat it like your history. And you know what history means to a Christian? It's his story. His story of how he saved you, he changed you, he delivered you, he redeemed you, how he made you beautiful. Your sin has no quarrel with the cross of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.14 says, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, even to our very conscience. So we can serve the living God. The reason why some of us raised our hands today is because your conscience is screaming at you. But the Bible says, The blood of Jesus cleanses your conscience. Isn't that a good, good father? Amen? Let me tell you what the Hebrew rendering of that verse really means. Here's what we think. Like we come up on a waterfall and we're dirty. So we get underneath that waterfall, we get cleaned up, and we go on our way. Well, if we get dirty, we got to come back, right? The Hebrew rendering of this means you see the waterfall, you get under the waterfall, you get clean, but now you're somehow able to take the waterfall with you. Which means you are constantly under this waterfall. The blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing you from all sin, even to your conscience.
conscience. So you can serve the living God. And that's the reason things hold us back. is because our conscience is screaming at us. We all know the scripture that says, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. We all know that advocate means what? Lawyer. Again, let me just give you a little insight here. I don't know if anybody in here has ever had to go in front of a judge. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Everybody's looking around. All right, well, let's just say, you've got to go in front of a judge. You're guilty of a crime. You've got confidence in your attorney, but it's the judge you're scared of. And that's what you're telling him. I've got confidence in you, but, but the judge is, 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 is terrifying. But the attorney says, listen, don't worry. Trust me, we got this taken care of. It's going to be okay. And you're like, okay, I get it, but I'm still a little worried about that judge. So what happens is you walk into the courtroom with your attorney, and he sits you down at the defendant's table. Imagine your surprise when your attorney just keeps on walking, goes up to the judge's bench, and he has a seat behind it, and he looks at you, and he says, I told you I had this covered. And you, and you understand now that the judge of all righteousness is also your defense attorney. He says, I told you, it's done. That means the guilt is gone, the trial is over. That will never happen in a court of America, but it happened in the courtroom of heaven. Thank God the blood of Jesus takes away our sin. I love it one preacher, how he put it. He said, you don't have the right, the legal right, to go back to your past except for one reason, and that's to dance over what God brought you out of. So much of supernatural victory up here is just basic math. Basic math. What are you talking about? The equation. 2 Corinthians 4.13 I didn't mark it in my Bible, so I'm going to have to turn there. Y'all give me a second, won't you? Y'all heard that joke when evangelists come and preach. How many of you give me five more minutes and you raise your hands? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Y'all get that? 2 Corinthians 4, 13. It talks about when David says, here it is right here. It says, so we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. There's your equation. Believe plus speak equals victory and power. That's why it's so important when the devil comes into your head and tells you you're not good enough, that we speak and believe the promises of God over you. Promises like Ephesians 1 says, I am accepted in the beloved. You know what that literally means? It means I am a highly favored, loved child of God. I am beloved. That's who you are. Understand this today. If the devil can convince you that you are not loved, ladies and gentlemen, he's got you in bondage. Amen. Oh, listen. I was reading a book about the grace of God, and, and, and this author brought this out so powerfully. And I wanted to share it with you. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. The heavens are opened up. You remember what the Father says? Boom, this is my... Beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Very next chapter, the Spirit sends him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. First thing the devil says is, if you really are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Okay, you have an acknowledgement in both chapters that Jesus is the Son of God. But the devil leaves out one word. Can you pick it out? He leaves out the word beloved. Could it be that the devil was trying to convince Jesus because of what you're going through, because of your temptations, because of what you're dealing with, oh, you're a son of God, you're just not a beloved son of God. Could it be that right here this morning, those of you that raised your hands, oh, you're a daughter of God and you're a son of God, you're just not a beloved daughter and son of God because of the junk you've come out of, because of the temptations you've because of your many trials and your many failures. Could it be the devil's trying to convince you of that this morning? Maybe the enemy's trying to tell you that God is just, he's always mildly disgusted at you. Don't you know that that is the biggest lie that hell ever perpetrated on the believers? Listen, the devil knows that he can convince you of that. You're going to go back to condemnation, which means you're going back to bondage and you're going back to your past. See, that means... That means that you're all, you're all bound up again. 
So how do you combat this? We use the math. Every time the devil comes at us, we say, no, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, period. I am a beloved, highly favored son and daughter of God. Hey, it takes a thought to replace a thought, right? If the battle is up here, that means that we can win with a thought. Listen, because Jesus is highly favored, because Jesus is accepted and worthy, that means you are highly favored and worthy and accepted this morning. If you love Jesus, if you've been saved, and you raise your hand this morning, I want you to say this out loud over yourself right now. We're about to close, okay? Say this with me. I am. I am. Come on, say it out. I am. I am. Perfectly loved. Perfectly accepted and perfectly forgiven because of Jesus. God wants you to catch this this morning. More than anything else, He wants you to catch this. Because when you believe this, it opens the door for all kinds of giftings and opportunities and anointings to flow through you the way you were intended to be loved and used by God. Can you dare to believe that there are giftings in you that are dormant, that God is waiting to wake up, and the only thing that it takes is for you to believe, I really am a highly favored son, daughter of God. There is no condemnation. When God looks at me, he sees me, and he loves me, and I'm good enough. Amen. How do you know that God wants us to catch this? First, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. You know what that word receive means? It means to catch. Mom is a huge Atlanta Braves baseball fan. Fanatical about it. Now, batter hits the ball, goes to shortstop, nobody's on base. Where is he going with that ball? First base. Is he going to do this? I don't think so. I think he's going to rear back and burn that thing. Hurl it to first base. Straight as he can. So the first baseman, all he's got to do is reach up, catch it. He doesn't have to work for it. doesn't have to stretch for it. He just reaches up and receives it. That's what was done for you at the cross of Jesus. Hey, hey. He reared back and he said, I want you to get this. Get this love. Get this grace. Get this identity. Get that you are highly favored. Get that you are perfectly loved. Get that you are perfectly accepted. Get that I have giftings and anointings inside of you. All you got to do is believe this. That's what he wants. He's hurled this at us this morning. In all of your feelings of condemnation, in all of your, all of your feelings of not good enough, God, in the middle of this, has reared back and hurled this all this at you today. Listen, when you were growing up, I'm about to close. You know evangelists say that ten times for the text. I really am. When you were growing up in grade school, I hope you didn't stand in front of the mirror and go, I've really got to try to grow today. Come on. Get up there and get another inch. Nobody did that. At least I hope you didn't. What did you do? All you did was receive nourishment. You just got it in you. And then naturally, without even realizing it, oh, man, three inches in the last few months. Wow, I didn't even notice. Keep getting it in you. And when you do, you're growing. You're being made to look like him. Does that make sense? Why is this happening? Not because you earned something. No, because you have already been placed in a place of perfection in Christ Jesus. See, it's who we are that fuels what we have, that fuels what we do. Does that make sense? It's not the other way around. A lot of the church world, we get that backwards. Oh, we got to do something real good first. Then that means I earn what I have, and then I have this wonderful identity in God. No. No, no, no. It's the opposite. You are a son and you are a daughter. You have been made perfect, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. 
You've been made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. You have an inheritance. You have blessing. You have favor. That translates to what you do. Does that make sense this morning? See, the more you receive him, the more you just get him in him, the more that you grow. And the more you're changing. Oh, I'm loving people that I didn't used to, used to love. I'm not, I'm not liking to say those words I used to say. I'm not as angry as I used to be. What's happening? You're being made holy because you have been made forever perfect. How much does God love you this morning? When you're at your lowest, he will throw and hurl life and hope and redemption at you. All right, I am closing with this illustration. And everybody goes, Phew. My wife... Y'all usually get out of well, Okay, all right. It's her fault if y'all stay too long. Listen, really, really in closing, my wife is gifted in, in, in making homemade greeting cards and what they call junk journals. She's got this site called Simply Vintage Design. Wonderful, wonderful artwork. It makes it for any occasion. And uh, one time, uh, my wife got a call from a lady. She said, she said, I got a friend who is facing a terminal illness. And she said, I want you to make a card for her and just do something with horses because she loves horses. That's all she told me. And so Gretchen got to work on something and she said, hey, honey, she said, do you remember that movie, Secretariat? How many of you saw that movie, Secretariat? In case you don't know, Secretariat was probably the greatest racehorse that ever lived. Still holds the speed records for Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and the Belmont States. Secretary won the Triple Crown in 1973 after, what, 25 years when nobody had done it. They thought it was impossible. Penny Chinnery owned Secretariat, and she literally bet the farm that Secretariat would win the Triple Crown because the farm was in foreclosure. Bottom line, if he wins the Triple Crown, we save the farm. If he doesn't, we go on her. And there's a movie about it. It's an incredible movie. And she said, do you remember the scripture that was... Uh, written about that, that, that Secretary had opened up with that movie out of Job. I said, yeah, I believe I do. And it was about the horse. And it talks about how the horse, it says, it says that it laughs at trouble. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't shy away from the sword. Uh, it talks about how he, he he's, has, he, he's given strength. Here it is right here. It says, Paul's the earth and rejoices in its strength when it charges in the battle. It laughs at fear and is unafraid. It doesn't run from the sword. Well, she took that scripture and put it inside that card. And then in the movie, Penny Chinnery, and in real life too, she's having an argument with her brother about whether or not to sell a secretary to get some money. And she makes the statement to her brother, it isn't about going back, it's about life ahead of you. And you run at it because you never know how far you can run unless you run. And she took that phrase and put it on the front of that card. And she mailed it off. It was probably, I don't know, several days later that Gretchen got a message from the woman that ordered the card, and the lady with the terminal illness had wrote a note about receiving that card, and I want to tell you what she wrote. This is this. She said, how could you possibly know that today was the day I simply gave up? I had no hope anymore and secretly decided to just quit fighting. First time I had faced hopelessness. Your card arrived, and I couldn't believe what I was reading. Penny Chinnery and Secretariat are my heroes. Nobody knew that. I've watched that movie so many times and I know it by heart, but what really spoke to me was the Bible verse from Job. That's my favorite book in the Bible, my go-to book when I get down. You were just amazing and I feel your prayers. Thank you is not enough to express my appreciation for your love and encouragement. I simply don't have the words to express how I feel about your kindness. You're truly a godsend. You've lifted me up when I was at the lowest day of this journey. God bless you. You are truly an angel on earth. I love you. You know what happened right there? I'm going to tell you what happened. At her lowest, you know what God did? <laughs> and here's what God does for you right now where you are this morning. If you raised your hand, this is God. <laughs> you are loved. You are accepted. You are highly favored. You're good enough. You see, the next time the devil throws condemnation at you, when you're at your lowest, when you're at your trials, temptations, 
And next time he tells you you're not good enough, next time he's holding up all the junk that broke you, remind him about that kid's Corey thing. I am more beautiful. I am more valuable. I have, I have because I've been broken. There's a treasure inside this earthen vessel, and he is the one that holds me together and gives me my worth. Can I give you one more scripture as you're standing with me this morning? <laughs> June 24. Listen to it. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault. Here's what I want you to hear. And with exceeding great joy. Why do we think? Why do we believe the lie that God grudgingly gives this to us? He's looking back. All right, I want to forgive you because I have to. I get you into heaven because I made up. I got to keep my word. No. Exceeding great joy. I want you to walk free. I want you to know that I made you good enough. I want you to know that you're a highly favored son. I heard a preacher say it like this, and I'll close with this. We have a good news gospel, not a bad news gospel. Amen. Now, I have gone, I have attempted to go for the jugular vein of this lie in your life that you've raised your hand, said that you deal with, because I'm going to tell you, I raise my hand with you, because about once or twice a week, sometimes more than that, I have to thank that. I do. I have to use those very scriptures. So I preach this message to me as much as any of you. The question is, are you going to go for the jugular of it now? Are you going to respond today and say, you know what? I know my past is wrecked and hideous and, and all kinds of crazy bad, but my sin has no quarrel with the cross of Jesus Christ. Before I was even born, he saw it and he took it upon himself and paid it. It's finished. Are you going to respond today and say, God, all right, I'm coming to you and I'm believing. Maybe for really the first time, I'm a highly favored, beloved son and daughter of God. You forever made me perfect because you're making me holy. I believe what the cross has done for me. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, period. I'm walking out today knowing that in Jesus I'm good enough. Knowing in Jesus there's no condemnation. I'm just going to ask you, if you raised your hand with me this morning, just come on. Let's do, before we get out of here, come on. I just want you to come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Forget about what anybody else thinks. I'm the preacher. I'm up here. I'm standing with you. That's me. That's me. I want to leave it here today. And in those moments, it all comes back. In those moments where the devil tries to tell me I'm not beloved, what do we do? We use the math. Believe plus confess equals victory and power. No, no, devil. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No, no, devil. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No, no, Satan. I am a highly favored, beloved son, daughter of God. I am fully accepted in the beloved. Why did God say accepted in the beloved? Why did he say beloved? You know why? He's putting you in a category. Who else did he put in that category? This is my beloved son in whom I will. You know what Jesus is doing there? He's saying you're in the same category as my son. We got a good news gospel, not a bad news gospel. I am the love of God. So right now, can we take, just get it in your hands. Let's do a little yada this morning. You know what yada means. It means it's an Old Testament word for praise and worship. It means to throw up an empty hand. It means to take the junk, to take the lie, throw it up.